the first will be a, a general overview from me of the statutory provisions, um, fairly high level, because it's probably an area that a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, and then Gary is going to go on and talk about um, some of the tactical considerations that you may want to consider um, in any cases that you have. So as I try and move it on uh, to the first part, by way of introduction, I'm sure you're all familiar, um, really account freezing and forfeiture orders are the evolution in the, um, the proceeds of crime um, act. Uh, they're built effectively on, on the cash forfeiture provisions and mirror in large part those provisions in terms of wordings and, and the principles that apply throughout the statute um, came about really because of the gap in the legislation allowing law enforcement to uh, freeze money that was being held in bank accounts uh, in, a, in, in a summary way. Uh, and when you look at the fairly well reported case of Merida Oil, where um, the City of London Police effectively um, manipulated the process um, of two companies who were trading with uh, energy derivative contracts for the broker of those firms to uh, issue checks. Then they went on to obtain a production order, seize those checks before seizing them under the cash forfeiture um, and detention provisions. Uh, and the High Court said, no, that's an abuse of statutory power. Um, you can't do that. So it really exposed there the gap in the legislation um, that was needed. And following that, really, we have the Criminal Finances Act comes in uh, and these powers really come into effect in 2018. Uh, and their use has been um, really quite remarkable, a real uptake by law enforcement, yeah, um, F um, HMRC, SFO, um, NCA and police forces in um, freezing funds initially. Uh, and now we're coming to the time when uh, those two year periods on the, on the freezing will run out and we'll start to see many more account forfeit, forfeiture uh, hearings and, and orders being made. So, as I said, um, built on the cash forfeiture provisions. Uh, and the important point really here is that in the absence of any case law at the moment, the magistrates' courts really have been treating um, the body of case law that, uh, and the significant body of case law that surrounds cash forfeiture um, as being applicable to the account freezing and forfeiture regime. Uh, they are heard um, as proceedings uh, on complaint, uh, and really, uh, there are three stages. Uh, that's in relation to the cash forfeiture, of course, the seizure of cash over a thousand pounds, detention, uh, and forfeiture. Uh, as you will be aware, proceedings in the cash forfeiture are in rem, so against the cash itself, not in personam. Uh, and when we look at the account freezing and forfeiture orders, uh, they're also in REM proceedings, but against the account itself, not necessarily the funds. Uh, 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 and then we look at, of course, the balance being civil proceedings um, uh, and that applies cash freezing and forfeiture orders. <clears throat> so when we look at the statutory provisions, um, they're outlined there. I, I don't seek to go um, through them in too much detail. But the proceedings commence with an account freezing order. There's no seizure as you would expect, uh, or, or as, as you would expect, because there's no cash to be seized, but in, in a different way to the cash uh, forfeiture provisions. As I've said, there are applications that are made in the magistrate's court uh, and made by an enforcement officer as, as prescribed by the Act, uh, either an HMLC, um, uh, uh, SFO officer, or an accredited financial investigator. So what is um, an AFO? Well, it, it, they effectively act like a property freezing order or a restraint order uh, would do. They prevent withdrawals or payments into the account uh, and, as I've said, apply to uh, a bank account. The application is ordinarily made on notice to the account holder. There are provisions within the Act um, for a without notice application to be made uh, if it's likely to pre prejudice uh, the steps in seeking to forfeit the money. Um, difficult to envisage in circumstances where a, a moratorium period is applied to the account. Uh, 
uh, but that, that would be an issue and that's probably largely why they are ordinarily being seen to be made on notice um, if they are made ex parte then of course the duty of candor provide um, provisions apply uh, as with all ex parte applications uh, that's an interesting area actually uh, and I think in the experience of some within chambers um, often because of that first application where it's being made without notice the um, the AFIs tend not to have instructed counsel uh, and are making the application themselves um, trying to get in before the long lists at uh, Westminster take place uh, and it could be a potential issue for challenge at a later stage if you become instructed of it in a later stage to uh, whether or not in fact um, the duty of candor has been properly complied with there. So applying for the um, account freezing order, so this is the first stage of, of, of the two uh, in the process. Um, application must be in writing, uh, that's set out in the rules that apply um, and being um, Effectively, the, the criminal procedure rules don't apply because they're not criminal cases, neither do the CPR because it's not being heard in the, in the High Court or County Court. So they have their own rules which are particularly scant in detail and actually leave a lot of room for um, being creative in terms of uh, applying. And what's in, 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 in difficult really when you're defending these is that Although the enforcement officer needs to provide written information, the rules are completely silent as to when that information should be provided. And so often what is happening when you're defending these, in my experience, is you're turning up at court with a very vague idea of what the basis of the application will be. And then at court you're handed a significant uh, and detailed 16 page or so information which outlines the uh, the, the, the reasonable grounds for suspicion uh, and the basis, real basis on which the application is being made. The grounds as I've, um, the test as I've set out there is, is reasonable grounds to suspect that money underlined uh, held in the account is recoverable property or intended for unlawful conduct. And the reason that money's underlined there is because it relates to uh, the all or part of the credit balance. So it's not necessary that the entirety of the funds that are held in the account are said to be um, recoverable or intended for use in unlawful conduct, but just the part of that credit balance is. Recoverable property, of course, is defined in the Act under Section 304 as property which is obtained through a, by unlawful conduct. Um, important always to go back to basics with that. I know it really helps me when I sit down fresh and look at a case and consider whether the money has been obtained by that unlawful conduct if that is what is being alleged um, and then throughout the, the rest of the uh, provisions as amended any currency um, can be subject to a freezing order so so long as it's greater than the minimum minimum amount which is one thousand pounds in uh, sterling the purpose of the freezing order stage really is to allow the enforcement authority to investigate the origins and intended use of the funds um, the ultimate purpose really being to apply for that forfeiture order the freezing order can last for up to two years um, but if it's less than that there aren't any express powers within the act to make a further freezing order and if further time is needed um, must it must be an application to extend it uh, under the Act. Those applications to extend seem to be dealt with in, this, in a similar way to the cash forfeiture provisions by the courts, where really what the courts are assessing at, at that stage uh, is whether or not sufficient investigation has taken place to um, justify the continued uh, detention and, and and see what further steps are being made. Um, whether or not the magistrates can grant a new uh, or a further um, freezing order is an interesting question. I think it's one that Gary's had some experience of recently where I think an, an officer for um, a law enforcement agency hadn't put in the application in time uh, and in fact the order had expired. 
um, and I believe that Gary uh, can go into a bit more detail with you, but Gary persuaded the, the district judge that in fact um, a further order could be made in those circumstances, although actually the Act is silent on uh, that situation. Setting aside um, the freezing order, uh, so there are provisions for order to be set aside. Um, it can be made by any person that's affected by the order, although there's no definition within the Act or any case law that really uh, deals with what an affected person is. Of course, common sense would be any signatory to the account is an affected person, but query other financial arrangements where um, that could be uh, an in interesting issue as a third party, whether or not you amount to an affected person and can apply for the order to be set aside. Another interesting thing about setting aside really is that there is no express test within the Act and that differs from the cash forfeiture provisions where there is the test that the initial reasonable grounds for the detention being made no longer exist. But when we look at the uh, freezing order provisions, that's not the case. It's simply the relevant court may set aside. Um, in reality, I think the courts are going to uh, adopt a test of there are no reasonable grounds to suspect any longer, uh, and therefore they'll set aside. But when you look at recent cases, um, such as the NCA's fairly well publicized case against um, uh, Pakistani national, Mr. Malik, uh, who was uh, the owner of one Hyde Park place, that property in fact became part of the settlement agreement for the freezing order uh, and was therefore set aside. So that, whether or not the, uh, the, the court were satisfied that the, there were no reasonable grounds to suspect that the funds obtained within the account or obtained by uh, unlawful conduct or for future use in unlawful conduct. Uh, we can query that, but there is scope there for the court to allow those kinds of settlement agreements under these provisions, which is an interesting uh, aspect, I think, when compared with cash forfeiture. And then the ultimate aim of the freezing orders is to move to the forfeiture order proceedings. Uh, those, uh, again, uh, are made uh, in the Magistrates Court. You can see the, the two limbs, uh, the, 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 the aspects that the court must be satisfied by. Uh, and importantly, of course, at this stage, it's no longer reasonable suspicion, which is the, which is the, uh, the standard. We're looking now on the um, balance of probabilities. Where the court at that forfeiture hearing doesn't make the order, the freezing order ceases to have effect immediately. Um, save for uh, the ability for the applicant to uh, notify the, the wish to appeal any decision, um, uh, grants 48 hours for the appeal to notice to be lodged. Uh, and if the, uh, uh, in terms of powers for appeal for the uh, respondent, then you would look for your 30 days to uh, lodge an appeal. Uh, go for a full rehearing in the Crown Court. So that really is the, um, the overview of the statutory provisions, it's quite a high level overview, but I'll pass over to Gary now, who'll go on to talk about some of the tactical considerations. Okay, thank you very much, John. Before I speak about the tactical considerations, one of the things that occurred to me just while I was listening to John, and one of the things that I think is interesting about account freezing and forfeiture orders is how they are being used so frequently so quickly and what that means is they're throwing up in my experience so many different issues across the board none of which have been dealt with in the high court and so there's no real guidance in other words it's a bit of a free-for-all at the moment as to how you interpret these provisions that Contrast with cash forfeiture. Um, cash forfeiture provisions started in 1990 at the Criminal Justice and International Cooperation Act. And what happened is that 
gradually over the course of time, the problems that were found in practice were ironed out largely by high court judgments. And that allowed enforcement authorities to develop and adapt their approach. Here, what you have is a number of different enforcement authorities from the police, to HMRC, to the NCA, to the FCA, to the SFO, all trying to hit the ground running and all with different approaches. And I think it's worth bearing that in mind because it is an interesting area and quite how it's going to develop this early stage is very much in my view up for grabs. Next slide please John, I was dying to say that. Dying to say that. <laughs> Got a bit like Sir Patrick Valance. <laughs> right, so um, one of the first things that I'm gonna talk about is, is what the best way from a tactical point of view is to respond to either an account freezing order or an account forfeiture order. So the kind of things that you'll be thinking about, what points do you actually need to address? Once you've identified those points, how should you go about addressing them? What are the evidential considerations that you need to take into account? And what are the tactical considerations? So that those are the points that I'm going to be exploring. Um, and your precise response will often vary according to what you can actually glean or work out about the source of the financial uh, investigator's information. So you'll recall that a moment ago, John told you that the financial investigator's information will obviously often be provided to you very late, but you yourself may be able to work out where they're coming from if you give it a certain amount of thought. That's going to depend upon when you're instructed, and a lot is going to depend upon the quality of the information that comes from your client and the degree of trust that you have in the quality and the reliability of your client's information. So one of the first things to start about is, is a little thought about where in all likelihood the account freezing order has come from. And as John has said, and, and as I've already introduced to a certain degree, it's helpful to compare these with cash forfeiture proceedings, particularly when it comes to the origin. Cash forfeiture proceedings are very reactive in their nature. If you like, the cash finds the investigator, often by chance, um, and the investigation begins there. Account freezing orders are different. Not only do they allow the enforcement authorities to be more proactive and measured in their approach, but they frequently originate in the responsibilities that the banking institutions have set out under part five of the um, of POCA, of the Proceeds of Crime Act, and in particular in sections 330 to 339. So what is what are frequently known as SARS. That kind of collaboration between private and public spheres is at the very heart of the government's economic crime plan and it promises to remain at the very heart of their strategic plans for how to deal with economic crime for the foreseeable future. Here in this slide, you've got two types of disclosures that I'm relatively confident will be familiar to all of you. The first is that a banking institution commits a criminal offence if they have a reasonable suspicion that a customer is engaged in money laundering and do not disclose disclosure as you probably know to the nominated officer within the institution the mlro and then to the nca that's set out in section 330 it's called the required disclosure the second relates to specific transactions so for if, if for example a client instructs the bank to execute a transfer of a sum of money the banking institution suspects because of the nature of the transaction that it's the proceeds of crime it will commit an offence, 327, 328, 329, if it executes that transfer without making an authorised disclosure and obtaining consent. That is frequently called a DAML, Defence Against Money Laundering, and that is a authorised disclosure. So those are the two kind of disclosures, and it's important to be aware that both of those types of SARS are predicated upon the fact that the banking institution has a reasonable suspicion. That reasonable suspicion is subjective, 
And if that reasonable suspicion does not exist, then the banking institution itself puts itself at risk of civil proceedings from its customer based upon the fact that it has not complied with the banking contract. That reasonable suspicion based on the bank's transactional knowledge of its customer is likely to be the starting point of the financial investigator's investigation. It's not infallible. It is capable of being challenged. But first, you need to identify it. So the next slide, please, John. In this next slide, um, I've just set out the time frame for the authorised disclosures so that you know the kind of time frame that you are looking at. The reason why is if you're instructed during this period, you have the ability to act in a preemptive way in anticipation of a likely account freezing order. So the time frame, all set out in the statute, almost certainly well known to all of you, is once the statutory notice that has been made, there's a period of seven working days triggered. The transaction is paused, effectively frozen during that period. And if there is refusal within that time, then the moratorium period of 31 days commences. And during that time, the transaction remains paused. It can be extended, as you see, by application. Often it won't need to, because in that 31 days, practically it would have been passed to a financial investigator who then will do the investigation and will consider whether or not it's appropriate to make an account freezing order application. Uh, next uh, slide, please. D during this time, it is highly likely client of yours will have realised that he no longer has access to his bank account. So his account will have been frozen and you may well have been contacted, I know I have, about uh, from clients with those kind of problems in the past. Their account suspended, they don't know why, any attempts that they make to get in contact with their bank to find out why are obviously met with very little information. The bank are keen not to tip them off and commit an offence uh, uh, under the proceeds of Prime Act. So when they're coming to you, as we hope they will do, um, asking what's going on, um, this is your thought process, I would suggest. First of all, to think about whether or not this has been caused by a SAR. It may not be. Uh, the bank has got its own procedures and its own uh, regulatory regime within it operates. And of course, it, it, it has to act proactively. But if it may have been caused by a SAR, it's important to identify which one. So is the concern of the bank that lay beneath the SAR a transactional one, or is it the way in which they connected to their client? Is, are they concerned about the information that their client has provided them with over the time? In order to find that out, one of the things that you can do is commence proceedings against the bank. There are two examples there, the case of Sharp, relatively well-known case, and the case of Lonsdale versus Nat West. Mr. Lonsdale was a property barrister. He was very upset when Nat West froze his accounts, and he acted swiftly um, to seek injunctive relief against NatWest, compelling them to execute the transactions that he wanted them to act. One of the things that that achieved is disclosure of the fact that there had been a SAR and of some of the circumstances around why the SAR was made. What was not disclosed was the SAR itself. Typically, you'll find that those will not be disclosed. But nevertheless, an expensive method but a method that enabled both Mr. Shah and Mr. Lonsdale to obtain information about what was going on in relation to their bank accounts. Of course, these need to be taken swiftly. That's fairly um, obvious because of the time frame within which that you are operating. So if you have then established that there is going to be an AFO, what can you do? Um, well, uh, uh, as I've suggested, the key is trying to find out what has led to it. Um, some of that information may be available from your client, particularly about how the bank account's been used, what the recent transactions are, what information your client gave to the bank when he was opening it. What did he say he did? How did he say the account was going to be used? Is it in his own name? Is it a business account? He will obviously, or she will obviously, 
obviously be anxious, but you need information to decide what to do. And in particular, you need information to decide whether or not you're going to challenge the account freezing order upon its application, so at the very outset, whether you'll keep your powder dry and wait and apply to set it aside. And so those are the kind of things you're trying to find out. What does the bank know about your client? What has the financial investigator been told? Is this part of an ongoing investigation? Is it new? Is it based on a single transaction or the entire banking relationship? If it is based upon a single transaction, will that remain the inquiry? I think the answer to that is probably not, because it's important to realise that the account freezing order freezes the monies in the account. And so it's focused upon the balance. And the account forfeiture order also focuses upon the balance. So it's very unlikely that although the investigation may have been triggered by one specific transaction, that it will remain focused solely upon that transaction. So the next slide, please. In order to decide whether or not you will challenge the initial application or wait and apply to set it aside, a lot will depend upon the quality and the reliability of the information that you get from your client. Now, in my view, there is a real tactical advantage in challenging the application for an account freezing order at the outset, presenting the strongest case that you are able to at that stage that the money in the bank account is legitimate, trying to catch the financial investigator off guard when his case is at its weakest because his investigation has only just begun. Of course, the other side to this is that the test that has to be met by the financial investigator, if he is on his own or by counsel if instructed, is a low. That doesn't mean that you need to concede it. Uh, if you are intending to do that, I would suggest that this amounts to attending fully armed with a bundle containing, if necessary, witness statements, documentary evidence, all of the bank accounts, because let's face it, many of these bank accounts will be obtained in due course by production orders anyway, but probably not at this stage. So there's a tactical advantage in turning up and saying both to the financial investigator and to the court, well, I've given you everything you need. You don't have it yet. Here are the bank accounts. Here's a transaction. Here's where it's come from and allowing it to be traced back. So adopting a full, frank and open approach. Now, it will be abundantly clear to you for reasons that are obvious that that is not a tactic that's going to be available in all cases. But where it is, I suggest giving it some serious thought and let me give you an example of why. A recent case where I was instructed in, we were able to do just this. And what we did was we attended with a bundle fully prepared, which showed exactly where the monies came from. And we served them on the financial investigator and on the court there. And then what we did was we said that we weren't prepared to concede there and then that there were reasonable grounds to suspect that the monies held in the bank account were uh, the proceeds of crime, were recoverable property. The reason why we did that is that were we to have done that, it effectively, in my view, um, makes it substantially easier for any application, where in that case, the initial application was only for six months, because there will be no further and separate application to extend, rather it's an application to vary the order, in my view, that enables the applicant to say, well, it's already been found that there were reasonable grounds to suspect. And therefore, to the court on a subsequent occasion, you don't need to reconsider this matter. I simply ask you to extend, and this is the progress that we've made. So for that reason, I was keen not to concede that there were reasonable. Another reason, and that was more tactical, by turning up fully prepared with witnesses, it put time pressure on the court. What I was effectively saying was, well, we're ready to go. We want an hour and a half of your time now. 
And of course, the magistrates court did not have an hour and a half of time spare to hear that case then. Um, and that will almost always be the case because of the nature of these applications. They're made with short notice and that puts a high demand on the magistrates court. So what do they do? Well, there's very little choice. Either they hear it there and then and sit late or they adjourn it. And if they adjourn it, which is what happened in this case, they adjourn it without the order. And to that extent, you've succeeded. Um, and as for where you go from there, well, that will depend upon the nature of the case. But it certainly gives you an idea of the kind of tactical considerations that you advantages in terms of saying, well, here is my case now, at its strongest, uh, I suggest to you that there are no reasonable grounds to suspect. And also what you're doing in this particular example is you're coming across as someone who wants to help uh, and who is entirely transparent about the approach that you're taking. And of course, such an approach is likely to engender favour with the magistrates because it looks reliable and credible. Gary James here. James, yeah. One of the one of the middle roads that I've come across is where a respondent will attend court, sometimes with counsel, at the first hearing to show that they're taking the matter seriously. But they say that we we don't concede that there are reasonable grounds to suspect, but we're not actively opposing your application. We're just here to observe that the magistrates are making a proper decision and you know, um, obtain as much information as they can from the officer, a copy of the information to take away and consider. And that at least then if you're in a situation where uh, you, you know, your client's position is not known, you can at least impress upon law enforcement and the court that you know, the matter has been taken seriously without giving too much away. I think James, there's a real advantage of doing that if what you're gonna do, and this is the next slide, is eventually apply to set it aside. Um, so if you're going to if you're going to apply to set it aside, um, I think that obviously what you gain is your own time frame, your own timetable. So you can make that application whenever you like within the period that's granted to to, to the enforcement authority. And if you're going to do that, then why not go hear what's being said? Maybe even ask some questions make it quite clear that you haven't conceded it. Um, but of course, what follows from that concession, even if it's not a, even if it's a, a, a tacit concession, is in my view, it will make it easier to extend the order. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, Mark, moving on to setting aside, which is where, where we've got to. Um, this is the same slide that John had, but I, but I want to, I want to look at it in a, in a slightly different way. And, and that's um, looking at section 303Z4 to, to highlight some of the complications that I think are in it. Complication number one, what is an effective person? Um, and you'll see that I, I put there, does it include a liquidator? Let me explain what I, what I mean by that. In my view, person affected by the order plainly includes the account holder plainly includes the bank or building society, almost certainly includes anyone that has a beneficial interest in the funds, and probably, probably includes victims if they're able to trace the money. If it's a company in an account and it's the liquidator of that company, then they're affected as well. Here's where it can get a little bit more confusing. What if, the monies in the account are the proceeds of a fraud that's committed abroad. That is not infrequent. Those fraudulently obtained funds were held in the account of a number of businesses abroad um, for the purposes of the fraud and for money laundering. And all of those businesses are now insolvent. So you have insolvency proceedings abroad and a liquidator appointed abroad. And before becoming insolvent, those companies have transferred money to a company in the UK that's not connected and that company is solvent. So for example in those circumstances would, and I'm not suggesting there's any answer, would that liquidator have an interest so that it makes it an affected person in those funds? And would the position be different if the victims of the fraud also come forward and say 
well, in relation to those monies, they're mine. I want you to release them to me and to do so without the inclusion of the liquidator. So what you have there is kind of competing claims, some of which were litigated in the case of the serious workers, Wastel, the Stafford International Bank, so competing claims. So those kind of competing claims, and believe me, they can exist in cases, you'd have the magistrates court dealing with those. They're complicated. And the view that, that I have is an affected person, plainly it's been drafted very widely, um, but does it include a liquidator in those circumstances? And if you add to that the fact that there's no express test of setting it aside, what is the test? Obviously, in relation to cash in sections 297 and 301, what you're asked as a respondent to do or an applicant in relation to those particular sections is effectively show that the grounds for suspecting that the cash is recoverable property no longer exists. But well, that isn't the same in section 303Z4. I'm sure it's implicit, but it certainly isn't express. No idea why that is. And of course, in any case where I am instructed, what I'm seeking to show is, and, and, and it was implicit, of course, in what James was saying earlier, what I will be seeking to show is that there are no reasonable grounds to suspect. I think it's interesting that it's not. Um, next slide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, looking at the time, I'm gonna fly through these next slides um, relatively quickly, because I think they're, they're quite straightforward. Um, the statute itself makes it makes it clear that you can vary an account freezing order um, so as to make exclusion. Of course, the, the way it works in account freezing order is it, it imposes a restriction on the monies, the withdrawals and the payments from the account. That prohibition can be, can be varied so to make certain exclusions to allow for living expenses, trade expenses or legal expenses. And in the event that someone wants to make that application, it needs to be in writing and the grounds need to be specified. Uh, uh, things that you may want to consider in relation to leave, leave, living expenses are the length of the account freezing order, because these applications are limited to the account freezing order. So how long is the order going to last will obviously be relevant to the amount of living expenses that there needs to be. Uh, whilst the magistrate's court will understand living expenses in a very rudimentary way, if the amounts that are being asked for are large, and they may well be, then there's going to need to be some information to support that. So witness statements, proof of expenditure, bank statements, and so on. Um, legal expenses, which is, I think is a few slides further on, I'm going to deal with those relatively uh, swiftly. Um, so in relation to legal expenses, unlike provisions under the cash forfeiture part, here you are allowed to make an application to vary for reasonable legal expenses and it ref reflects in relation to part five for civil recovery so the property freezing order provisions in relation to these it's important to, to know there's no definition of proceedings but it only covers legal expenses in relation to proceedings under part five so civil recovery cash forfeiture listed assets and these and although it doesn't say um, pending proceedings, it is likely that what you're dealing with is it, these proceedings that exist during the currency of an account freezing order. For example, you'll be unlikely to get legal expenses to cover an account forfeiture order in preparation for that when an application at that stage has not actually been made. Um, so um, let, let, let's move on for reasonable legal expenses. I think it's fairly well set out in the slides and in a minute you've got the case of the National Crime Agency versus Davis and that sets out the way in which the High Court approached an application to vary a property freezing order to allow legal expenses and the fact that the High Court need to be satisfied that there are available uh, other available assets and the rationale behind this is as John said these are proceedings in REM the entire allegation is that these are the proceeds of crime directly and therefore if there are other assets available that are not the proceeds of crime well then of course um, the respondent should be using those. Uh, next slide please John. Um, moving on to account forfeiture orders which 
uh, really are the end game, of course they are. And John set out the test and it's reflected there. Um, so on the balance of probabilities, the monies held in the account are either recoverable property or to be used in future unlawful conduct. And of course, as you all know, it's incumbent upon the enforcement authority to specify the type or types of unlawful conduct. Frequently, that will be money laundering. But there are evidential requirements. Um, it, it, unlike cash forfeiture cases, which often focus on uh, the very suspicion that emanates from the carrying of a large amount of cash, and the inferences that the applicant enforcement authority will invite from that, that, that that's gone here. And so the application itself demands a, a more focused basis, concentrating on a specified identified underlying criminality and the way in which it can be argued that that criminality is linked to the funds in the account either directly or by inference. The other difference and it's important difference is where of course audit trails can be difficult with cash there is an obvious audit trail available for any investigator in relation to bank statements. The credits are often not always, for example, where there's been cash deposits, but the credits are often capable of being traced and production orders can be applied for so that the source of the money can be identified. But um, one of the things to consider, uh, and one of the things that has occurred to me, is it will be important to be clear about the applicant's case in relation to the account. For example, if the applicant's case is that the entire account contains no legitimate transaction, well, then that will provide the applicant and the magistrate's court with a degree of simplicity. However, if the applicant concedes or is forced to concede that some of the monies that have been paid into this account are legitimate in their origin, then you have a mixed fund bank account and then you are probably going to need to consider some tracing rules, which is another example of why these kind of proceedings are not cool, if it wasn't obvious. Before we go into tracing, I'm gonna speak very briefly about the case that I know that both Edmund and James were involved in, as an example of the kind of considerations that can exist not preferring one side or the other, because that wouldn't really be of any assistance, but really just to illustrate the way in which uh, evidential considerations can be borne out uh, in an application for forfeiture. The, the two of them, as I understand things correctly, were both uh, after the Westminster Magistrates Court made an account forfeiture order of about 460,000 pounds, relating to the funds held in the bank accounts of Luca Fila, the son of the former Prime Minister of Moldova, Vlad Fila. Uh, James's case, for the, on behalf of the NCA, as I understand it, uh, was that uh, Luca Fila, the son, was a full-time student with no financial profile in the United Kingdom, and so it could be inferred that the account balances had derived from his father, that in relation to the father, he had been convicted um, and his convictions show that he'd obtained a bribe via his involvement in corruption offences in Moldova. Uh, and the way in which the balances of the accounts have been dealt with, or the way in which the balances of these particular accounts have been generated, namely by way of international transfers from companies in the Cayman Islands uh, and Turkey, was redolent of proceeds of crime. And let me pause, which I've gone about outlining that you may think is more common to an unexplained wealth order application than an account uh, forfeiture application. Um, a, a case where you're looking at international transactions and foreign-based corruption. Uh, it, finally, in the region of, I think, £100,000 in cash was paid into the account over a four-day period. And so the, the National Crime Agency's case was the money had been obtained through corruption offences and through money laundering. Um, on behalf of the appellant, um, Mr. Burge of Queen's Council argued that really what you were looking at here was his and his family's existing sources of legitimate wealth 
that he had his own business activities in the Kurdistan regional government, including, as I understand it, a restaurant, supported by documentary evidence, and that wealthy friends had lent him money. Uh, 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 these businesses were thriving, and they were his only source of personal and business funding. It will be immediately obvious to you that this is a case that would have been well litigated abroad, because, of course, the, apart from the bank account, the entire criminality and the nuances and the inferences that can be derived were foreign-based. And to correctly and properly interpret those, you need some understanding of the society in which they took place. That calls for expert evidence. Um, and in this case, I think the point that comes out for it, from this particular case, this is a case where uh, on appeal it was the NCA and Mr Fletcher that succeeded, even though I'm sure he'd accept that there was little evidence actually directly linking the money uh, to the underlying crime. In essence, his case was, we can't show that the money is directly the father's, but if it's not his, whose else can it be? Now that's an argument that succeeded, but the point that I want to, well, there are two points that I really want to highlight from that particular case. The first is to give you an example of how documentary and the particular uh, evidential competing arguments can actually be borne out in practice. And the second is to come back to my earlier point. The, uh, the, in, in these, particularly in that kind of case, there was a need for strong documentary evidence, appropriate expert evidence, and a judge that's engaged in the issues. Two of those, I'm sure uh, Edmund would agree, are within his capabilities to actually arrange. The third, probably not. Um, it really highlights the advantage in striking early to the extent that you can, turning up with all of your, all of your arguments there and ready to the extent that you're available uh, to you at that point and saying, this is the case that I present, um, can, you, can you challenge it now? I'm gonna say a little bit about tracing and uh, section 308 and then I'll open it up to any questions that you have. So, in a case, or in any case, where there is a concession that part of the monies in the bank account are lawful, then because you're dealing with a mixed fund, um, it will be incumbent upon either the applicant or the respondent to try and identify how the balance is made up. So as I said earlier, the account forfeiture order is directed at the balance. And where you're looking at the balance, obviously the balance is going to be made up from a number of different credits. The starting point, as I've set out there, is the rule in Clayton's case, um, frequently known as the first in, first out, or the FIFO basis. These cases, or tracing cases, are typically litigated in the High Court and beyond, and they normally require, or normally involve uh, the interests of competing beneficiaries, often in funds. Uh, often they are in innocent beneficiaries with competing arguments. A and part of the criticism of the first in first out basis is where, as you see highlighted there, that these are common innocent beneficiaries, for example, victims of crime. If you adopt a first in first out basis, it can be unfair because it allows for an arbitrary dis distinction as to who gets what. So just because my money, for example, was stolen first, and spent, why should I have less claim on the amount that remains in the bank account? It is in essence where we are. But in these, in this case, on these examples, in account for, you probably won't have, in most cases, those kind of competing examples. And, and so I suggest that this will be suitable for a first in, first out basis analysis, mainly because it's logical. You're looking at the balance, you're looking at where the balance is made up. And if you adopt a but for test, but for the most recent credits in time, well, the balance wouldn't be as high as it was. Um, but it's by no means certain. Um, but it's worthwhile considering in any case in which you're a respondent, what are the most recent credit entries into that account? Are you able to unpick those by just showing that those, even if you can't show all of them, have a lawful source. So picking 
the very outside of the case to show, well, um, no one's thought about tracing rules. Again, I think it, it illustrates just how complicated these can become and just how poorly conceived it was to place these within the hands of the magistrates court. The final um, section, it's not in the slides, that I simply want to make reference to in passing because it's already, um, it's already uh, received some attention and that's section 308 of the Proceeds of Crime Act, which uh, sets out the general exceptions to what is recoverable property and effectively codifies equities darling. So the principle that a bona fide purchaser for value and without notice um, will succeed in his claim. So even if he's dealing with recoverable property, if he has obtained it on good faith, the value and without notice, then recoverable property may not be followed. This is an argument that is being deployed in many cases that I am aware of. Um, this would cover, for example, money in the bank account, in the bank account that's been put there in return for services that have been lawfully provided, goods that have been lawfully sold. The key concept in that particular section is good faith. So the extent to which the account holder was acting in good faith and the extent to which they have wittingly, unwittingly, with knowledge or with recklessness, involved themselves in a criminal enterprise or involved themselves in a money laundering scheme. That's what I want to say about section 308. And just to conclude uh, with the final slide, if I may, John, um, these provisions are favoured by enforcement authorities because they're easy to obtain. There is frequently less judicial scrutiny. They allow for the effective and frequent recovery of large sums of money. They do so speedily and the litigation risk for the enforcement authority is small. For those reasons, they're attractive, and for those reasons, they will continue. Their use will become more and more widespread. And uh, they are already being used, as I think Edmund's uh, and James's case illustrates, in a way that they probably weren't designed for. But their ability to adapt to that, in my view, will ensure their continued success. As for the purpose of trying to get across, it is there's a lot for you to learn in relation to the very early stages and the information that you can obtain and the nuances that you can exploit and the way in which you can push your client and the enforcement authority with information that's available to you at an early stage. Um, thank you.